Well, hopefully we'll bring some insight today with the presentation Mike and his team have put together. Um, we'll get started. So everyone that's on the call, thank you so much for joining our Purpose Life call today, where we're going to be talking with Churchill Mortgage, um, Mike Hardy, Kevin Sprague, um, Steve Chikarian. They're on the call with us um, this, this afternoon, I guess. But they've been um, sharing with our team some insights and keeping us informed. Um, if you know myself, Sarah Dykema, and um, I know we have some of our agents on the call, Carmen Dyer and, and Adri Dalma. Um, for me and, and Adri, I know this is going to be one of our first uh, market shifts. And so as real estate agents who are top, top producers in our own areas, like we definitely uh, lean on our professionals um, that we are are aligned with in the marketplace. Um, Tim and, and Deborah Galley are on the call too, and there are title reps with DeVray and just leaning in on people that have um, experienced the market from the past and um, pouring into us. But then what they share with us, obviously, we want to bring to the people that we get to do life with and get to share knowledge with and hopefully sell your home and help you purchase homes. So we've got um, an array of different people on this call. I know I've got just some friends that have joined that I, I always keep informed of the market. We've got some, some clients that we're working with. We have some potential sellers actually going to be listening to this. We have a, a good lineup of people that also um, want to get the, rec the recorded version of this after. So we just hope this brings you some insight. Um, I'm going to turn it over here quickly just so we're not spending too much time on the front end. But just know in case I forget to mention this at the end, um, or if you have to jump off early, this will be our new Purpose Life. Um, every first Thursday, 12 to 1245, we're going to do a lunch and learn um, and bring you guys some um, great information of just all things um, real estate, housing, um, different aspects of um, of home ownership, we'll call it that. Um, I hope next on the docket, we're waiting for confirmation, but we'll be with our trust attorney that does estate planning and, and building trust for our clients. And so we wanna get um, Bill Blaster on this call with you guys um, the next um, the next time we meet. And then after that, we have a, a tax, um, real estate tax uh, um, accountant that will come on and, and just help us getting aligned for 2023. So talking about 2023, we've invited Mike and his team to come this morning or this afternoon and just share what can we expect? We see rates spiking. We we hear the word recession, um, housing bubble crash, all the things. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys and um, we'll have questions at the end. Feel free to put things in the chat. We'll be checking that along the way too. So go Fantastic. For it. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it. This will be a fun conversation because it's a little spicy out there right now. So we're going to, uh, we're going to unpack it. And um, we've got a, uh, we have, we have a saying, which is math tells a story. And this is called facts, not feelings. There's a lot of feelings out there. So we always want to look at the facts. So this will be a back and forth between Kevin and myself. And I think what we're going to do today is we're going to go through and really understand what we're calling the state of the markets to answer the question, will 2023 look like 2008? Okay, that is one of the things that is on a lot of people's minds because they've seen a run up in prices and they think, you know what, I kind of remember that or my parents went through that or whatever the case may be. So are we going to have that happen again? So um, this will be some back and forth, but the things we're going to cover today are interest rates, supply and demand, foreclosures, lending standards, affordability, that's a big one, inflation, recession, and then how do I make a healthy decision for me and my family to buy a home or to sell a home? And just to share some context as we get going, um, there's I grew I grew up actually with very little money. My we lived in a we lived in a uh, trailer. My parents had the one end. Me and two sisters were crammed in one little bedroom at the very end in this tiny little hallway. And I remember when when we bought our first house. I was just a kid and it's like the whole world opened up. I had my own room. I could think clearly. It's like the environment changed. And so when we talk about housing, I think there's two things that are really important because to me and to our group, healthy families is super, super important, in my opinion, to having a healthy society and healthy families come from healthy homes. And so what we do as professionals to help with a healthy home environment, I think is of utmost importance. So it's what is a healthy environment? And then how do I build wealth and improve my financial situation 
for myself and for my kids and for their future. So this home ownership thing is a big deal, not just for the money side, but for the well-being of our society. Okay, so there's a lot behind this for us. So I share that and we're going to get into some of the some of the facts and some of the feelings. So first of all, I want to share this slide because 77% of consumers when surveyed think that there's a bubble of some sort. Okay? 44% of real estate professionals think that there's a bubble that it persists. A bubble in concept, like this actually comes from Shakespeare's All the World is a Stage, this concept initially, but it, it, it begs the potential for a crash if it's a bubble. And so what we're going to talk about is, are we in a bubble or not? Um, is there a correction that is happening and can happen in a significant manner? Is there a crash that can happen? So we're going to do a little bit of history first. I'm going to go over to Kevin. We're going to talk through some interest rates, and then we'll do some back and forth. So Kevin, over to you. Yeah, so so it's no secret to anyone. Thank you, Mike. And it's no secret to anyone when we look at this chart here. This is obviously in the news. It's in the headlines. You can't miss it. Interest rates this year have dramatically increased, right? This is a chart that looks at your average 30-year rate on a mortgage from the beginning of 2020 until today. You can see rates in the threes and the twos. And then all of a sudden this year, from the beginning of the year till now, I mean, we've gone from, you know, kind of right here in the mid threes at the beginning of the year, and we're up here today in kind of the mid sixes, depending on the day. So this is one of the big things that's driving fear right now. And, and I see it too online and in the, in the media, all you see everywhere is it's a bad time to buy. It's an expensive time to buy. There are big challenges with affordability. We'll talk about that uh, as we go on, but we thought it was important to show context with this as well. Because when we look at interest rates on this next chart over 50 years instead of two, still a significant increase. You can see it on the right hand side of the screen here, but rates in the five, six and sevens are not historically an outlier. The big question is what are what are prices going to do as a reaction to this and what can people still afford to buy? So we thought this context was really important just to show to set the stage. We'll come back and talk about affordability because the interest rate's not everything. The price of the house obviously matters and really income and, and overall inflation matter as well. So um, this is how we wanted to start with showing this context that we think is really important. Um, but then we'll talk a little bit more about the supply and demand too, just the basic fundamentals of supply and demand. I'll turn it back over to Mike for that um, to, to kind of start that conversation. All right. So supply and demand, that drives that drives prices and values. And we're going to look at first something I find absolutely fascinating, which is demographics and how demographics play into what we're experiencing real estate right now. And then also what we went through back in 06, 07, and 08. There's a saying I like, which is demographics is destiny. Okay. This is kind of like you skate to where the puck is going to be. And if you want to have an idea for any industry, and in our case for housing, we have to look at a wave of demographics. So why do we have this slide? Well, People overwhelmingly buy a home in their early 30s. 33 years old is the average age. And I want to draw your attention to people that were turning 33 in 2006 compared to people that are turning 33 today. Look at this, guys. This first red arrow in the circle, you can see the number of 33-year-olds coming into the marketplace had a pretty significant drop-off. How about that? Right about the same time as housing went down. Okay, that's one of a whole series of factors, but that's one we want to point out. Look at where we are today. 33-year-olds today, guess what? They're pouring into the marketplace. Of the generations, silent generation, the boomers, X generation of millennials, millennials is by far, uh, the, that wave is the largest. And as you can see, we've got more and more pouring in and we have a dramatic amount of support or significant amount of support that will be there for some time as far as new buyers. You may be asking what the heck happened back in 2006. Why was there a fall off of 33 year olds coming to the marketplace? Well, go back 33 years from 2006. That was when? 1973. Guess what happened in 1973? Very prominent Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade, abortions are legalized. And you can see how that plays out with uh, folks in our demographics. So kind of a sobering thought, but what we say is demographics is destiny. That's one of about six things. So we're going to keep an eye on that. We're going to stay on 
the supply and demand. Kevin, over to you for some uh, household discussion. Yeah, so this this chart shows 2007 to today. Again, we're comparing, are we going to crash again? Is this similar to the to the run-up to 0809? This is just simply the number of households nationwide. Not all of these are potential buyers, obviously, but just from an overall demand standpoint, we've it, it, population has increased by about 14 million households in that time frame. So we'd have a much more we think stable footing on the demand side if we had equal inventory, equal amount of houses. Anyone who's gone to buy a house in the last couple of years knows it's really hard to find a house right now. There is not a lot for sale. So the next chart we'll show, which I think is really important, this is inventory levels, homes for sale nationwide. Check out the run up from 2000, right where my cursor is here in the middle to 07. In 07, just before the crash, there were 3.8 million homes uh, um, available from an inventory perspective. Look at the drop off since then. We've seen a little increase. You might see that in the, in the media right here at the end. We're still underbuilt by two, three, or, or excuse me, undersupplied by two to three million homes compared to the peak right before the crash. This next chart, I think, illustrates it really well, too, right? Months of inventory of homes for sale. You can see 07, 08 into the crash was very, very oversupplied compared to the demand levels. And we've been dropping off ever since. So even though we're picking up a little more inventory than a year or two ago in some months, um, we're still heavily in a seller's market. It's coming a little bit closer to neutral, but we think this is one of the factors that's going to hold prices somewhat steady from, from, from away from crashing, so to speak, whether they go up or down a little, we'll talk about that in a minute, but you know, the, the fundamentals of supply and demand, what we're illustrating here are just significantly different this time around um, um, than they were 15 years ago. Okay. Moving to this next one here and guys, what well, again, what we're doing is we're wanting to, we, we're wanting to answer the question, is there a crash coming? Okay, that's a fundamental question. Is there, where is the concern in the marketplace? Is there something where the bottom can fall out? Okay, so again, that's why we're going through all the basics of supply and demand. This one is really interesting because it shows new housing permits and starts in the marketplace. And if we, if thinking back to that previous slide with demographics and, and new buyers coming in, what do we have? We have existing inventory and then we have new homes that are built. And that's how we satisfy the need for housing existing inventory, new homes. For us to keep up with the increase in population, we need to be adding about 1.5 million new homes to the marketplace every year. Well, you can see the problem here, guys. Look at, if you were to just sort of draw a line across from the left to the right, there's this there's this huge vacuum. There's a, There was about a decade where we just flat out did not build anywhere close to the number of homes that we needed, okay? And that's one of the reasons you add the low interest rates that we had over the last couple of years. That's one of the reasons that we had a run up in prices. Let's go to this next slide because this illustrates it pretty well. Uh, also pretty well. Household growth in annual completions. Okay, think of this with the blue is the demand and the orange is the supply. And if you look at the, the red arrows, you can see there was a huge drop in formations like we could see in the other slide. We had the most completions of new homes in history while all of a sudden the buyers just fell out, fell off. Okay, so think of it as if you know you've got uh, you've got a hundred and then hundred and thirty and hundred and fifty homes, and you've got a hundred buyers, and then all of a sudden the buyers drop to fifty. What's going to happen? Prices are going to come down. Now you fast forward over to the far right, and you can see the households forming are more than the completions taking place, guys. So this is basic supply and demand. Okay, so we share that because, okay, I understand that, but if we look at this next slide, what about all the foreclosures we keep hearing about in the news? Okay, there's headline after headline after headline about foreclosures. Let's put that in context and take a look at the foreclosures that are happening in the marketplace. Next slide. Oh, how about that? See that, see to the far right, that surge that took place that you saw where all the headlines of foreclosures, the surge was specific to a moratorium on foreclosures that happened during the pandemic, right? So we typically have, I think it's about 100,000 annually foreclosure starts that take place. Right now, you can't see it. There should be another quarter in here that we don't have yet. We're kind of getting back to the usual run rate. We're still a little bit below it. But the point, guys, is that when you see all the scary stuff in the news about these waves of foreclosures, you got to put it in context. 
and look at, we're actually below the usual run rate. So it sells in the news, it gets eyeballs, but it's not an issue. Okay, all right. Well, what about all the folks that went into forbearance? There was upwards of 5 million folks that went into forbearance and there was talk of how that's going to crash the market when all these flood the market at once. Well, again, math tells a story. Let's look at the data. You can see that over the last couple of years, the forbearance folks, forbearance basically just means that you don't have to make the payment. There's you know challenges with the pandemic. And so uh, it was the government's way of just providing some extra safety. Majority of people that went into forbearance did so more out of like caution than dire need. Okay, we have study after study of this. So the point is like, the folks still in forbearance, that still needs to work through. But from that previous slide, it's not enough to move the needle in terms of crashing the market. So we did want to show you that. All right. Again, back to some supply and demand. Next, we're going to look at equity and equity cushion. Kevin, back to you. Yeah, this we think is really important, too, as a big difference um, between this market and the market leading up to 08 is the equity people have in homes. One of the reasons the crash was such a big deal last time around, look at some of these numbers in two, uh, up in the top right here in 2009, which is right in the middle of the, of the meltdown, one quarter of homes, one in four were underwater. They owed more than they were worth. Today, we're between one and 2%, depending on the month, mostly because of the run up the last few years in prices. Average equity in homes today nationwide, 68% rather than 37 back in 07. And then this stat to me is really crazy. 95% of homes nationwide have at least 10% equity in them. So what this tells us is when people do have to sell with economic challenges, you know, some of the forbearance stuff Mike was talking about, they aren't necessarily underwater. They have equity where they can sell and the inventory can be absorbed by the market, which is much needed right now. But they don't need to go into distressed, you know, foreclosure, forbearance type situations or short sales. So this we think is really important. This graph, I think, illustrates it as well, where you can see from 2000 till now, you know, the green is equity and homes. The blue is mortgage debt. Um, the equity position is just so much stronger this time around, as you can see, has really accelerated the last few years. So this is a big difference. We can dive deeper in this in the Q&A. Um, one other thing that I think is well on people's radar that's different this time around, too, is the quality of loans. Um, this is one chart that shows the amount of loans being written with a credit score below 620. You can see 03 to 07, really high, high high volumes of loans being written to less qualified buyers. Credit score is not everything, but it's one measure we look at. And you can see from 2008 until 2021, very, very different ballgame in terms of getting a loan. We uh, uh, Income analysis is something that's much different now too. So when challenges persist, which they will, we have homeowners this time around that are much more well qualified for the payment that they have. And another thing is when the Fed's raising rates, almost all of our clients are not, or almost all homeowners, I should say, are not in risky loans. They're not in adjustable rates that um, have to worry about those rises where their payments affected. So Michael talked talk about that as well, but um, the, the quality of borrower is better and the quality of loans themselves, the product is much better this time around as well. So I'll turn it back over to Mike to talk about that. All right, guys, look at this slide. This I love this slide because it's the best picture of the difference today in terms of where we are versus uh, a product risk in the past. So think of this. I grew up in New York and Connecticut. I used to go ice skating as a kid. And so think of the red as kind of like thin ice. Unless all conditions are perfect, it's going to fall through. And if you look back at 1999 through 2006, the height of 2006, about one third toward the tail end of all of the loans that were being written were risky products, meaning it was like thin ice. It could fall apart if all conditions weren't perfect. And when the Fed raised rates, guess what? It fell apart. That was enough to crash the market right at the same time as a, all of the buyers kind of like, you know, you had the, the X generation. There was just a, a significantly fewer buyers coming to the marketplace all at once. We had the perfect storm. Today, guys, look at this. If you look at where we are today in terms of loans being written, our group, we, we help about over the last five years, it's been about 5,000 families with a purchase or refinance. I'm telling you, the quality of borrowers in today's market is so strong. It's about 3% of folks have any sort of product risk at all, as opposed to what, 33%. So it's a fraction. We're talking one-tenth of the product risk. And on the borrower risk, we are light years better in terms of quality of borrower, just a different environment when we're talking under the surface. It's hard to see that. 
All right, so let's go to this next slide because I want to pull this all together. You guys have all heard, heard of the movie, read the book, seen the movie, The Big Short, okay? One of the key characters in The Big Short was a gentleman by the name of Michael Burry. He was the founder of Scion Capital, and he says something that just summed it up perfectly for me as we were researching this. Here, here it is. Home prices didn't crash in 07 and 08 because they had climbed so high. Home prices crashed because, among other things, borrowers could not make the mortgage payments. Okay, back to the previous slide, that red portion, the thin ice, when the environment changed, when we went into recession, guess what? All of a sudden, a third of people were at risk. Okay, so that's what brought down the market. Very different today. So why are we saying that? Okay, well, first of all, it's not all sunshine and rainbows out there. We're going to talk about that now because we have a serious affordability issue. But what we do want to show you first is that under the surface is very, very stable and calm compared to what we were up against back 15 years ago. All right, let's look at this affordability. Guys, this is a problem. Okay, it's a problem because about all of the first time buyers that are trying to buy all of a sudden now, instead of having the payment be 25% of their income to, you know, maybe 30% of their income, it's pushing 40% of the income to qualify. Most people, when you add that with what we're dealing with, with inflation, food increase, gas increases, they're saying it's sort of like sticker shock. Oh, I too much. Can't do it. Okay. Now here's the context. Some people think because of this, the market's going to crash. If we stay here long enough, we're going to run into some issues. I'll talk about that in a minute, but here's why it's not a crash. One third of all buyers roughly are cash buyers. Okay. Might be a little less than that. One third of all buyers are buyers that have significant cash invested in a property. And that's not an affordability issue. It's the first time buyer where we're losing a significant percentage of that. But again, we still have a shortage of housing. So it's almost like for every house before, those of you guys that are in real estate, you look back a couple of years ago and it's like, there's 10 offers, 20 offers on every property, okay? I We do a lot of flip projects and a lot of investing. I just had a flip project locally that within the first two weeks, we had two cash offers, very close to full price instead of over, okay? So it's the market has changed, but it is not falling apart. Now, with if with the interest rates, that's where we're running into an issue because- being in the sevens and the sixes, we're going to get to some psychology for a minute. Actually, Kev, let's go to the next slide. What about affordability? Like here's, here's what we're looking at. We have a payment for the average consumer that's about $1,000 higher than it was just you know a year ago, six months ago. Big deal, sticker shock. Now, what we do have to keep in mind is that household income has also increased and it's continuing to increase. Okay, so this will help, out, help, help offset it but at the same time, we're dealing with, look at this, food and gas and other services. So from a net cash flow perspective, people are feeling pinched on the affordability. And it's, it's a problem. It's the first time buyer that's really, really struggling here. All right. But that's not the whole issue. Next slide, guys. We have a buyer-seller standoff taking place right now. It's kind of the best way to describe it. Okay. It's a standoff. Why? Because buyers are thinking 7%, 6% interest rate, payments high. I'm only going to buy if I can get a lower price. What are sellers thinking? I've got lots of equity. I was going to move and I was going to trade up. But if I'm at a 3% interest rate, which I think about half the population is under 4%, and I'm going to go to from a $500,000 property to a seven dollars or $800,000 property, holy cow, my payment's going from 1000 up to 3000 Maybe I'll just do an addition. Like So there's a lot of this happening right now where there's some gridlock taking place, at least short term because of this buyer seller standoff. And in the past where you had all of the sellers, people had to sell, like they were forced to today's buyers, they don't. Okay. Now, is it a good time to sell? It's not a bad time to sell. And most people think like, is it a bad time to buy? <laughs> I, I actually think just the opposite, the opposite on the buying side. And I do a lot of real estate. We have a bunch of projects going right now. So this is not just in theory knowledge, this is practical real life. Um, I've been involved with about over a hundred real estate projects in the last 20 years. So this is like my personal assessment of the marketplace, but let's look at the psychology of what's happening. Next slide. Guys, this one is fascinating to me. This is this right here. If I could pick one other slide that is, is telling us what's happening in the market today, look at this. 
we have interest rates, if they're at a six or 7% range, look to the far right of this. Only 7% of the population is willing to buy. It's a psychology thing. Doesn't mean they can't afford it. Some can't, some can. Only seven out of 100 people are willing to buy if they're going to have a rate that starts with a seven. They're just like, ah, you know, too expensive. You mentally check out before you even get into the math, before you even understand what's going to happen like next year. Look at this. If there's a rate in the sixes, only 8% of the population, so 15% total of people are willing to buy in this marketplace. Guys, mark my words of what's going to happen next year. Some of you folks that are in the data, you know this and you see this coming. When rates get back into the fives, you open up a whole nother window of buyers. In my personal opinion, and, and I can explain why in Q&A, um, we're going to end up seeing some fours next year as well. And we're going to have another surge of buyers that are on the sidelines. And all of a sudden, from a psychology standpoint and an affordability standpoint, there's another wave of buyers that come into the marketplace that aren't even considering it right now. Okay. Fascinating. So I know we have a lot to get to in Q and a um, let's go to this next slide because I want to show what's happening with rents. You guys all know this rents are going up like crazy. Yeah. There's a little settling here and there, but the point is like the trend is up. Why? Because the big issue is there's an undersupply of housing and there's too many people that need it. Okay, and rents typically trail the effective cost of housing by about 12 to 18 months. Okay, it takes a while to catch up. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, I, Kev, I think we should, why don't we look at a rent versus own and why don't yeah. you take this next slide? Yeah, so this is really important for all of our, you know, clients, potential buyers right now to evaluate is like, what does it mean for them, right? Because, and this is just one example, but, you know, if buying is a certain price each month, but it's fixed over the long period of time, rents like you see in purple here are increasing over time there's a number that they're spending extra on housing but it's probably less than they think over a relevant window because most people are looking at it as of today what they're not taking into account too is if the property value goes up you know four or five percent each year you know on average over five ten twenty years and part of their payment is paying back themselves they're gaining a whole lot of net worth and equity by owning rather than renting. So this is something we try to show our clients that's really important to understand is it's not rent for zone today, it's rent for zone over a period that's relevant for them with a home. So really important to understand that. And then a couple key things just to wrap up and we'll get to the Q&A, inflation and recession, right? A, a, a lot of people are asking, hey, what about inflation, right? It's really hard to buy right now. And it is hard to buy. But this chart's really cool. It shows in green home price appreciation and in blue, the average inflation rate, depending on the decade. And home ownership, a tangible asset, is really a good hedge long term against inflation. Your cash is not, but home ownership and owning homes is. So, Mike, I know you want to touch on this just for a second, I think, and then, and then we can move on. Yeah. So guys, think about this. If you've got $100,000 in the bank and you have inflation, let's just, it's a little less than this, but if it's 10%, let's just say that by the end of the year, you all of a sudden have $90,000 worth of purchasing power. Yeah. Okay, that means if you're going to the store and you got 10 things to buy with a hundred bucks, you can only buy nine of them. So I was just at a non-performing notes and servicing default conference recently, just trying to understand like what's, what's happening deep you know, deep, deep, deep under the surface. And one of the things that I'm I'm hearing is that there's there are folks that are opening up. It was like the largest opening of credit cards um, in, I, I want to say it was like a couple of decades in April and May and June of this year. And you know what it was for? When they assessed that what the purchases were, it wasn't for like a, you know, it wasn't, wasn't for a new toy or a vacation. It was for food and for gas. So there's some certainly some stress on the economy um, in certain sectors of folks that inflation is really hurting. So why are we sharing this? Because real estate is actually one of the best hedges against inflation. Hard assets are. Okay. So regardless of what happens to, you know, fiat currency, real estate and other commodities tend to move and at least move in pace with, if not outpace inflation. So I think that's important. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Maybe last thing, and we'll start to wrap up a little bit here. Um, a, a recession is on people's mind. Should we buy before or after a recession? Does that mean we should wait? You know, this chart shows percentage of economists who believe a recession is within the next year. And technically, obviously, definition-wise, we may already be there. But you can see it's becoming more accepted, more widely popular that, that obviously a recession is coming. What does that mean for housing? What does that mean for interest rates? This is really interesting. Housing prices over these last six recessions, as you can see here, have stayed flat or in or gone up in five of the six recessions that we've seen since 1980. The only outlier to that is 2008, as you can see, which was a recession that was caused by housing, not housing being a, a reactive factor like it would be this time around again. So recessions do not necessarily mean that prices of homes are going to go down. And part of the reason for that, which this next chart shows, it recessions very consistently mean that mortgage rates are going to go down. So when we see rates dropping pretty dramatically throughout each of the last six recessions, that eases the affordability concerns, which can drive back up prices again when we have limited supply like we do right now versus demand. So this next chart is really cool. It shows that same interest rate graph we looked at earlier or earlier this presentation each of these highlighted positions you can see during recessions, mortgage rates are coming down. So that's part of our prediction of what's coming next. I'll let Mike talk about this, this with the next slide, but um, deflationary times, which typically recessions are, are not necessarily bad for housing. They are, however, usually good from, from getting a, a, a lower mortgage rate than where we are now. So guys, the question with a recession that we need to answer when you're trying to figure out how will that impact a real real estate values is what is the, the cross section of folks that lose a job, that lose their job, okay? But here's what we have to remember. And this is the reason that typically a recession does not cause housing to come down significantly or crash. Because here's why. Remember that other slide with interest rates of when people can buy psychology and affordability? Well, when you go into a recession, it's deflationary. Interest rates come down. Look at this chart right here. This is the Federal Reserve pattern right here. You can see all the way from Volcker to Greenspan to Jerome Powell now. And you look at the, at the very top, inflation went from 7 to 14. Mortgage rates, guess what they do? If you want to know where mortgage rates are going, they're going to be very closely correlated to inflation. Okay, Most people think the Federal Reserve is impacting the longer term mortgage rates. No, they have zero control over that. They control the short-term rate, daily interest rates, okay? Federal funds and discount rate. The market dictates what they think will happen to inflation and our returns, because if you think about it, a mortgage, we're all on the other side of that because we're investors and it's in our pension plans and our portfolios, okay? So one person's asset is somebody else's debt, okay? That's how our economy works. So I share this, guys, because mortgage rates go up and then look at this. What is the federal funds rate? Federal funds rate climbs way up to get in front of inflation. Inflation goes from 14 down to five and mortgage rates come down from 18 to 12. Next cycle, same thing happens. The Fed starts to tighten. Mortgage rates go up until the Fed gets in front of it. The Fed does their thing. And guess what? Inflation comes down and mortgage rates come down. We're right now in the middle of that next cycle. Okay, inflation. 1.5 to 8.5, mortgage rates, it's higher than this now, right? Up in the high sixes, federal funds rate, wouldn't surprise me if it's at 5% in a, you know, in a couple of months. Inflation, they tame it, and guess what happens to mortgage rates? And we all know this, if it's easier to buy a house from an affordability standpoint, values go at minimum, like sideways or slightly up, to increase. So that's the cycle we're dealing with, guys, and we're right in the middle of it. And one of the reasons I think it's, you know, a lot of people are scared to buy. This is an ideal time if you can afford it because you're going to restructure your debt in six to 12 to 18 months anyway and have a much lower payment, but maybe potentially be able to negotiate better in purchasing a house today because of the fear that's out there, okay? Home price forecast, here's the thing, guys. When we look at year over year, sure, there's, there's areas that got frothy, has to have, have to correct, like I get all that stuff. But what we want to answer as a group and for helping educate you know, our clients and those that we serve is, is it possible for the bottom to fall out? Can I buy a house at 600000 and have it be 400000 in a year? No. Supply and demand speaks exactly the opposite of that. When we look at home prices run typically 
what about four to five percent trend line over the last hundred years. Okay. When you look at there's actually a few more like negative forecasts, even from this. There's a few. Whoops. I'm still here. My camera just went <laughs> off. Let me just do that again, but I'm just keep talking. So um, okay, so as uh uh even if there's some slight declines, it's in my personal opinion, it's only because of the fear and the psychology of rates being higher. But guess what? That will adjust and correct itself, there's a lot of support in this marketplace. So that's what I wanted to share on that slide. We have a real estate report card. Kevin, why don't you cover that for the group? Yeah, we'll touch on this. I know we're right up against time. This is really interesting for some of our buyers. You know, we can pinpoint a county or a city and give them data on historical appreciation rates, you know, median prices, what's forecasted moving forward. What does that mean, right? If they wait, when you look up here in green on the top right, you know, what does inventory look like, income and employment for those areas? So we just try to help our clients make good, solid choices that's specific to them instead of very generalized. So this is something we help our clients with as well. Yeah. And this is fascinating because, um, oh, sorry, the, I mean, like one section right there, you can see actual homes being built and total homes needed in a given area. Okay. So if you want to understand like how much support is in a particular zip code, we have, we have data extensive data zip code by zip code i know sarah's got this too we've got some cool resources that we share so guys I, I i tell this because math tells a story and what we don't ever want to do is we do not ever want to make decisions based on fear or emotions okay our iq actually drops when we make emotional decisions so we're gonna hit pause do a little bit of q a but thanks guys for listening in and uh, let's see if we can answer some questions And Sarah, thank you and your team so much for having us to do this. I mean, we're just super excited for the opportunity. I hope it was good info. No, it was awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, anybody out there have any questions? What you think, Tim? I know Tim has questions, I'm sure. <laughs> we we met at Starbucks. I think we, we probably met for 90 minutes. Probably could have been like half a day with all the stuff we covered. Tim, uh, you're on mute. T uh, t Tim, if you can hear me, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Sorry. There we go. Sorry, guys. There you go. I just have a thought. I just feel like the, uh, the emotional side of buying real estate, when the rates start going down, mm -hmm. there's going to be a mad rush, yeah. which is going to be, you know, you're going to be back into multiple offers. Um, so I like what you just said, not to, uh, just a couple of minutes ago, that if you can afford it, buy now. You won't be in that madness that's going to happen as soon as the rates mm -hmm. drop. That was just my thought when you were saying that. Mm -hmm. I, you guys are nailing it. Tim, 100%, I couldn't agree more. The people that can't afford it, this is the ideal time to be buying. Because I'm telling you, when you get in the fives and the fours again, it's like, then you're with the herd. Okay, yes. It's no fun being part of the herd. Right now, people are scared because they don't have this data. And they think real estate went way up before it crashed. It's going way up again. It's going to crash. Different world we're in. I, and I, and guys, I, let me share this. I do a lot of real estate and I still have second guess this all the time. I'm like, okay, I'm buying this house, but what if, what if, what if, like in my own head, then I look at my own data again. I'm like, what am I worried about? Like, I've got the data in front of me. And I think how much confusion is out there for folks that like are not in the data and don't get this. And I'm in this business and I still am second guessing it. So like, that's just our human nature is like, is, are we going to get hurt? We can't help but think that way, but I 100% agree. The folks that are, are that are ready and do something now, they'll be glad they did. I'd love to add something in here, Mike. Um, and first, it says Christopher Prado. I don't know that we've had the opportunity to meet. Um, I'm glad you're on here, and you said I'm trying to absorb the information. Us too. <laughs> so you're you're not alone in that. Um, thanks for being honest. <laughs> um, However, uh, I wanted to add being on, on the real estate side as a, a you know, full-time agent, just to kind of give you a heads up where we're at out in our local market, even just looking at our local market of, we'll, we'll call it Glendora right now, um, it's all perspective because um, if you look at today's um, average price 
of a home, it's still higher than this time last year. And if we would have rewound to last year on this day, we would have thought we had really high housing prices, right? So if you're a seller looking to sell, you're looking at that reduction of what we had three months ago going, oh gosh, I just missed my window of opportunity. But the truth be told, you're still ahead of the game where you were a year ago. And so I think it really, you know, getting into the numbers, it really helps tell a story. But then on the buyer side too, I think the education piece that I can bring as a real estate agent, I think as, as a local buyer and part of this standoff is um, it's probably a big trust factor. I think you touched on that, Mike and Kevin, like, you know, not knowing what we're, what, what's going to happen and just kind of gambling and making it, you know, kind of seeing where we're going to go. And Tim, I can't agree more. I mean, that's an accumulation effect. Eventually they're going to have to buy at some point because these rentals, if they're in a rental situation, it's so high and it's, it's just pushing them out of even the rental market. And so there's going to be conditions that take them back into a, a market of competing. And so in this market, market today, our negotiations definitely look different. We just came out of three, four or five months ago where appraisal conditions are taken off or contingencies, contingency times are waived and, and changed and all that. It doesn't mean we're going out and we woke up one day and now, you know, what we were doing three months, four months ago of 90 to a hundred thousand over asking, it doesn't mean maybe that, but like you may have to offer asking price. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're getting, you know, I hear the word, oh, maybe I'm going to get a deal. I, I, I want to, I want to just be caution, caution us all in what that's going to look like and be really transparent because um, I just don't think we've gone from one extreme to the other. And so I always like to prepare my buyers out there and my sellers of the reality of the market. Is it everyone's time to sell right now? I'm going to be honest. And Mike and I were just talking about this yesterday on a mastermind call. I think that's probably probably one of the hardest jobs right now in my seat is being that honest with somebody that maybe it's not your right time to sell. Let's look deep. It. Let's deep dive that. Maybe it's not your right time to buy. Let's deep dive that. But at the same time, not, you know, the numbers are the knowledge and that's the power that we need to, to make a clear and, and a good decision on moving forward. So just a, a little tidbit from the real estate side of just being open and honest that you're, you're, what what's going to be a deal is going to be a good negotiation of of different things than we had three to six months ago and i'm happy to talk you through what those conversations are they are different so and i know you guys are doing things at churchill that look different too and feel free to share that now if you want mike too yeah there's sarah i think i think when times are complicated i mean it's what is it like there's safety with a multitude of counselors i think it's so important to have good guidance and advice from trustworthy competent people that that actually care about your situation like that's that is what keeps us all safe um but i just i know like in this marketplace um there's there is a lot of opportunity but what we never want to do as individuals is be emotional in our decision and it seems like, like there's greer, greed and fear drive the markets like they kind of like swing one way or the other and it's fascinating to me how there was just like this greed uh ur sense of urgency for a year straight and then all of a sudden it went the other way to just complete like scarcity and fear and uncertainty. You know, there's a cycle of emotions that we all go through in making decisions. But I, what's really important to us and Sarah, I think that's why we love you and your team is that um, not, not all realtors are created equal at all. Like not it's it's having the competency to be able to understand the data and then tell people the truth. I mean, we were talking about this yesterday, Sarah. In fact, I was telling the the, uh, the COO of Churchill about our conversation, which is how do you give the best advice to meet people where they are, um, whether there's business now or not, what our job as professionals is to tell people the truth, regardless of what the outcome is, period, hands down, right? So that's the whole point of doing these things is, and, and I think when you get around good people and they tell you the truth, you can then figure out how to make with data the best decision for you and your family. So that's why we do this. Um, there's all kinds of tools, guys. We'd, we'd love to help. We do a complimentary discovery call just so you guys know if there's ever a need for somebody that's trying to figure out how does the math work? What do the numbers look like? Is it safe? What about that area? Um, we do a complimentary discovery call that is simply helping people understand if it's smart to buy and what the math looks like. No obligation at all. Has nothing to do with the loans. We find, Kevin, I think we have a slide on this. So what I've found is that there's a space that exists between four oh. different disciplines, between like a real estate professional, a financial advisor, a CPA, tax professional, um, and a uh, um, 
and a mortgage professional right in the middle that's dramatically underserved. So we've taken it as our mission to go right in the middle to give advice and guidance on there. Anything related to debt management, real estate, wealth building. Um, I was formerly a financial advisor. So it's like, how does all this fit together? Yeah. But that's part of like why we do what we do. Um, and again, back to, back to if I don't, if I can compliment Sarah and her team, when people like tell the truth and help in the middle, I know you do this all the time, Sarah, as you help in the, in the middle as well, but I think that's really important in this marketplace. So um, yeah, guys, appreciate the opportunity to chat, Sarah. This is super fun to, to uh, go through all this. And each one of these slides could quite frankly be a 30 minute discussion. We covered a ton, a ton of info today. So um, I think well, this recording will be available if someone wants to go back and watch it. Yeah, and I think I've got everybody's emails from this call. Um, if I don't, feel free to put it in the chat. I'm happy to um, add you to the list and we'll make sure to get that out to you guys, um, the recording. And then Mark, uh, November 3rd, it's the first Thursday of November from 12 to 12.45 for our next uh, Lunch and Learn. And we'll kind of announce who, who's our confirmed speaker that day. We will be consistent with these. Um, we really wanna get you guys prepared for 2023 and then we'll take you in. And then I know we've got um, some people on our call in different states. We've got somebody here from Florida, Mike. So if real quick, before we hang up, what states are you licensed in? I think the last slide just said it, but maybe you can rattle it off. Out of state referrals are and connections are really important to real estate agents and lenders, but Mike and his team are, um, they are licensed out of state. And we also have a referring service out of state too, that we get you guys connected with out of state agents. So pretty much every state that somebody was going to move out of California because they didn't want right. to be here. <laughs> Yeah. All the exit states, we have all of them. So Florida, yeah. Colorado, you know, Nevada, Arizona, Idaho, Tennessee. Um, and, but we're and our Texas. platform. We've got we've got I think 40, 47 states on our platform. So if we can't help you directly, uh, we we have a trusted go to, to that we can connect you with. Awesome, cool. Well, thank you everyone for joining. We look forward to seeing you on November third. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions, and we'll get you guys the recording. Have a blessed day. Thanks, Sarah and your team. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah, Bye, thank, guys. You guys. thank you guys. Thank you guys. Bye. 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 Bye.